Welcome back to Lab Rat Lab. In this episode, I want to touch on kinetic energy and conservation energy and how it pertains to rolling bodies. Now, while I'm going to hit the usual math and science, this time I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to start off with a sneak peek of our experiment. What I'm going to do is run three circular objects, two hoops and one steel ball bearing, down inclined plane. And the question is, which one will get to the bottom first? Well, you might want to pause your video right now and think about what's going to happen and then we'll do the quick experiment and see which one wins. So here we go. Three, two, one, go! Well, were you right? Or were you surprised by the results? Now, of course, we can use science to predict the behavior of rolling objects. So now let's take a look at the math and the physics and see what governs the motion of these rolling bodies. The first thing we need to look at is the relationship between linear velocity and rotational velocity. Now here I have an animation of a disc and I'm going to roll it across the floor towards the right. Now for every revolution of the disc, the disc will move a distance that is equivalent to the disc's circumference. So if a one meter circumference disc is rolling along at one revolution per second, it will lay out the one meter long red dashed line in one second. Now notice the center of gravity, or the center of rotation of the disk, moved that same one meter. So if it moved one meter in one second, we can say that the velocity of the center of gravity of the disk was one meter per second. Now from this simple mind experiment, we can establish a relationship between the linear velocity and the rotational velocity. And that relationship is linear velocity is equal to the rotational velocity times the circumference of the disk. Now let's perform a simple unit analysis to see if the physical relationship makes mathematical sense. Once again, here's the equation. Linear velocity is equal to rotational velocity times circumference. If I put units in, I see that linear velocity is equal to revolutions per second times one circumference per revolution. And the revolutions cancel, and I get linear velocity is one over second times circumference. Put in units for circumference of meters, you see that linear velocity comes out to be meters per second. And that's the proper units that are needed for linear velocity. But engineers don't typically work in revolutions per second. It actually makes more mathematical sense to work in the unitless radian when dealing with motion around a circle. Now, engineers typically assign omega to represent rotational velocity. This means rotational velocity needs to be converted into radians per second. And recall from geometry that one revolution is two pi radians. So units of rotational velocity become omega is equal to revolution per second, which is equal actually to 2 pi radians per second. But the units of omega need to be in radians per second, not 2 pi radians per second. We need to divide the equation by 2 pi on each side. So we get omega over 2 pi is equal to 2 pi radians divided by 2 pi seconds. The 2 pi's on the right-hand side cancel, and so we get the proper units of radians per second. Now, from basic geometry, the circumference of a disk is calculated as follows. Circumference is pi times diameter, and diameter is 2 times radius. So, the circumference can be defined as circumference is equal to pi times 2 times radius, or in shorthand, circumference is 2 pi r. Now, inserting these new definitions for the variables into the linear velocity equation yields velocity is equal to omega divided by 2 pi times 2 pi r. And once again, the two pi's cancel out. We perform a little bit of algebra. We can see that velocity is equal to omega r. And finally, establishing a variable for linear velocity, linear velocity is equal to v, we get the simple relationship of v is equal to omega r. So that is the linear velocity is equal to rotational velocity times radius, with omega in radians per second. Now let's look and see how kinetic energy comes into play with a translating and rolling body. Now since the body is translating and rolling at the same time, two kinetic energies come into play. Linear kinetic energy, Ke is equal to 1 half mv squared, should look pretty familiar. There's also rotational kinetic energy, where Ke is equal to 1 half times the moment of inertia times the rotational velocity squared. Now since the object is moving in translation and rotation at the same time, the total kinetic energy is the sum of those two kinetic energies. As such, the total Ke equation becomes Ke total is equal to one half moment of inertia times omega squared plus one half mv squared. 
Now, earlier, we determined that velocity was equal to omega r, and thus omega is equal to v divided by r. Now, this allows a total kinetic energy of a translating and rotating body to be expressed in terms of just linear velocity. And performing necessary insertions, the kinetic energy equation becomes Ke total is equal to one half times the moment of inertia times V divided by R squared plus one half mv squared. Here are a few examples of some simple shapes in the equations for their inertias. You have a solid cylinder. You see the equation at the right. I is equal to mr squared divided by 2. You see a thick-walled tube and its equation and a solid sphere and its equation for inertia. Now, for this video, we're going to be focusing on the thick-walled tube and the solid sphere for our experiment. The ultimate goal is to be able to predict the velocity of an object after rolling down an inclined plane. Now, just as with a free-falling body, energy is conserved in rolling objects. So if a rolling object starts from a standstill and then rolls down an inclined plane, the initial potential energy is equal to the final kinetic energy once the object gets to a height of zero. Now, by applying conservation of energy to a rolling object, we can determine the linear velocity of the object after quote-unquote dropping a certain vertical distance. Now, conservation of energy says that potential energy is equal to kinetic energy. As we see that mgh, the potential energy, is equal to one-half Moment of inertia times V divided by R squared plus one half M V squared, the equation we determined earlier. Now the first step is try to isolate any like variables in the right hand side of the equation. You see in each of these terms we have a one half, we also have a V squared. So you can pull those out. So we see that MGH is equal to one half V squared times inertia divided by R squared plus M. Next, we can divide each side by one half and then divide each side by i over r squared plus m. And we see that v squared is equal to 2mgh divided by i divided by r squared plus m. And so the velocity becomes the square root of 2mgh divided by i over r squared plus m. Now it's not obvious from this equation, but since the moment of inertia for the object is a function of the object's mass, m, the linear velocity of the object is independent of mass. And that's exactly the same thing as with a free-falling body. Now let's pull this all together and work a sample problem. What I have is a thick-walled tube. It has an internal radius of 0.05 meters and an external radius of 0.058 meters. And the mass of the system is 0.069 kilograms. And the roll is down an inclined plane that has an initial height of 10 centimeters. Now here's the equation for moment of inertia. And you see it comes out to be a pretty small number. Once again, here's the equation for velocity. I substitute in the values. And remember to square this radius here. I can then cancel certain units. And we see that the velocity at the bottom of the inclined plane will be 1.02 meters per second for the thick walled tube. I built a spreadsheet to analyze the three test articles the small PVC tube, the large PVC tube, and the sphere. And you see the velocities that were calculated. Now here's the parameters that I put in. You notice that the height comes into play, but not the length of the ramp. So a short ramp and a long ramp will have the same end result. It's the height that's the important factor. Now we see that the small PVC tube had a velocity of 1.04 meters per second which is very close to the velocity of a large PVC tube, which has a velocity of 1.02 meters per second. And the sphere has the highest velocity of 1.18 meters per second. So it should be pretty obvious the sphere will get to the bottom of the inclined plane first. But it'll be interesting to see what happens to the small PVC tube and the large PVC tube. Now let's go back to the inclined plane to see if we can do some experiments to validate the theoretical predictions. Here's my test setup. I have a piece of plywood that's nice and flat, but it serves as my inclined plane. I've got three test articles, a large diameter PVC pipe, a small diameter PVC pipe, and a solid metal sphere. Now what I have is a starting bar here, which I can remove, and all the objects will start moving at the same time. You'll notice that the angle of my starting bar is not parallel to the end of the inclined plane. And that allows me to get my axes of rotation actually all lined up. So all the objects are free falling, quote unquote, from the same height. So all I gotta do is release the bar and let things start rolling and we can do the tests. Release. 
Release. Release. Release. Release. Now from the test videos, it should be obvious the metal sphere got to the bottom first every time. Now here's a captured image of the two tubes. We see in this case the small diameter PVC tube got to the bottom before the larger diameter tube. That means the smaller tube had a higher velocity, and that's consistent with the theoretical results. Now in some tests, this distance might have been closer. And on occasion, the red tube may have gotten to the bottom before the yellow. Now it's primarily due to starting issues. So to recap, the theoretical results had the metal sphere having the highest velocity and thus should get to the bottom of the ramp first. The two PVC tubes had very similar final velocities, the small tube being slightly higher. Now, the experimental results had the metal sphere winning obviously every time and by quite a bit of distance. The two PVC tubes reached the bottom at nearly the same time, the small tube winning by a hair most of the time. Now, these results are obviously consistent with the theoretical prediction. The theoretical calculations in the experiment point out something quite interesting. The large diameter PVC tube had essentially the same velocity as a small diameter PVC tube. So what's going on here? Well, the large diameter PVC tube had a much higher total inertia. So its rotation doesn't speed up as fast as a small tube. However, the large diameter PVC tube has a larger circumference and thus covers a greater distance for a given angular rotation. And balancing out the circumference and the inertias, we ultimately get the same velocity in this particular case. I hope I've given you some useful insights on how rolling bodies behave. Now, there's all sorts of interesting experiments and theoretical studies you can do. That includes looking at how the width of the tubes affect the rolling behavior. Or maybe look at the diameter and the mass and the inertia of the objects to see how they behave. Or even look at a snowball rolling downhill gathering snow, how its velocity changes over time. Well, that'll do it for this time. I hope to see you next time at Lab Rat Scientific.